Hey, what's up, everybody? And thank you for joining me for another episode of the podcast. Tonight, we're at episode number seven. I'm pretty excited for hitting number seven because in the podcasting world, if you can hit the number seven episode, the chances of you continuing on and even possibly being successful is is good. So I'm pretty happy about that. But I'm definitely happy about tonight's guest, uh, Michael Waldron. Uh, how to do this intro it's probably the seventh one I've done because I keep screwing up his title. So I'm going to read it so I can get this done right and so I can finish this up and go to bed. He's the Senior Vice President, Creative Director of Art and Design at TV Land. There you have it. So if you guys are interested in business, interested in design, I mean, Michael Waldron's pretty, he's done everything. Uh, so we discuss uh, everything that he's done from pretty much coming out of the school up to what he's doing now so there's a ton of great information that he shares uh tonight's episode so let's jump right into it all right this is episode number seven with guest michael waldron appreciate you guys checking it out and uh see you next week i appreciate you coming on man how you doing uh good good pretty good so you just came back from what you said tucson yeah yeah came back well yeah so i was in santa fe last week and then i came back from arizona yeah so i was in uh phoenix it was really 100 like 20 degrees 20 degrees yeah man 120 degrees. Uh, it was the hottest experience I've ever had in my life. Um, things were melting. It was that bad. So right now you're based out of New York now, right? Yep, based out of New York. Full okay. Time. And then you were at your TV Land now, right? So I'm the SVP creative director of TV right. Land, uh, Nick at Night, and Nickelodeon. Okay. I didn't realize you that you've been there for a while now. Dude, man, it's gonna be uh, five years November one. Okay. Five years, yeah. So I started when. Uh, I got promoted back in December and uh, started at Nickelodeon, Nick at Night, uh, officially January 1st. Okay, cool. So, yeah, it's been, it's, it's, uh, it's flying by, dude. I've been six months there at, at Nick and Nick at Night, and that's just crazy. Yeah. I know we've talked about it for the people listening. I mean, you started off what was in broadcast news. Yeah, right? yeah. Right yeah. Us- uh, WTVR in uh, Richmond, Virginia, man. Yeah. Down by VCU. Yep, VCU. Have you been back yeah. there recently? Uh, haven't been back. I think the last time I was there was like about a year and a half ago. Um, but yeah, I haven't been back there. I, I go to see, see my family in Virginia and in Roanoke, but I haven't been to Richmond in a while. Okay. Last Please. time I was back there, man, that place is crazy, dude. This, uh, VCU is taking over downtown Richmond. Yeah, it's starting to look like an, an actual real you know, <laughs> a school. Real school? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so then right after Richmond, what did you do? You went to, what was it, Dykes? Oh, uh, Dix Group, yeah. I went to the Dix Group in uh, in New York. Uh, it was uh, Brian Dix Design at the time, and okay. I went there in uh, in '99, and uh, yeah, I got started there. And uh, that's um, you know, I, I I was working for a small, I was working at WTVR uh, doing you know news graphics, and then I was freelancing for a small publishing company uh, called Tough Stuff Publications in, in Richmond. And uh, I decided I was going to be coming up to New York, and spoke to the CD there, and he's like, oh, you should reach out to a friend of mine, you know, Victor Newman. And uh, so I called up Vic and uh, just totally out of the blue. I was like, hey, this guy told me I should talk to you. And he went to VCU as well. And uh, so I went to New York and uh, met up with him and uh, sort of became, you know, really good friends ever since. Yeah, the VCU connection. Going so on. It's, it's deep, man. It's deep. Yeah. So how long were you working there? I worked there for almost four years. Okay. Um, I, you know, it was tough. It was, uh, the first year I was living in New Jersey and, um, I was living in uh, Metuchen and doing the, uh, hour and 40 minute commute every day. Wow. And I was working like, man, I was working like 60 hours a week, you know? And so I'd leave there at like 10, 11 o'clock at night and you know, get back home, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning and yeah. you know, get up at six and do it all again, you know, right. five days a week. So after about a year, uh, you know, my, my girlfriend at the time, we moved, uh, decided, you know, she quit her job in, in New Jersey. We moved to New York okay. and I uh, moved downtown to, uh, to, to Battery Park area. Yeah. I remember, worked there for three more years. I remember the early days when I came to New York and I was working for NBC and then I started freelancing with uh, Kendrick Reed when he was at Lifetime. Sure. Yeah, sure. And then I Kendrick. would, I was working the overnight. I would leave my shift, run over to Lifetime work all day. Kendrick would let me sleep in his office. He had a, a big old bean bag. I get like four or five hours of sleep there, head back down to 30 rock. I did that for about, I don't know, I think like two weeks or something like that. I was, yeah. It's yeah. horrible. But. We, when, I, when I lived in Richmond, I, you know, when I first started working at the TV station, I was working the night shift. I was working the one to 10. So okay. I did graphics for the 5.30, six o'clock and 11 shows. And when I first got there, we weren't, we weren't even using 
Mac, Mac at the time. We were using uh, what's called a Dubner paint box, and yeah. it was terrible. And so I was sort of freaking out because I got this job and, and I didn't want to lose my Mac skills. So what I did is I freelanced in the morning you know, this, at this publication company. I'd work there from 8 to 12 mm-hmm. and then eat on my way to, to Channel 6. At, right. at 1, I worked from 1 to 10. Do that you know, three, three weeks out of the month, and one week I only did you know, the TV job. Because um, I wanted to keep my, you know, my my Photoshop skills and my mm. Mac skills pretty tight. So yeah, dude, you gotta you gotta do what what you gotta do to make yeah. it work, man. Especially in the beginning. So I, remember I had that internship at MSNBC, and I was on the paint box as well. Okay, is that yeah. where you met Vic? Yep, that's how I met. He was at MSNBC. And do you know Vince Diga? Uh, Vince I do, Diga? I do. Yeah, yeah he was there great. as well. Okay, yeah. So I'm that's how I met, met those two guys, and nice. then that's what pretty much opened the door for me at NBC because NBC was still using a paint box. Okay. At the time, so. That well, that kind of worked out. It's funny when I when I um, moved to New York, I actually you know it's back when you had to make tapes, you know, mm-hmm. to kind of prove yourself, right? So I couldn't afford to make more than ten VHS copies, right? So I did did nine that I, you know I went through and I find like nine comes I really wanted to work for, and then uh, and, and then MSNBC was kind of like the best of news. So I was mm-hmm. like, that, that might be a, that might be my entryway into New York. So <laughs> I sent uh, MSNBC a tape and I sent nine tapes out to people I wanted to work for. MSNBC offered me a job right away because they were starting to convert over to uh, uh, to to After Effects, mm-hmm. and um, and then the other nine, com- nine companies I, I reached out to and I interviewed a couple places and you know got a job offer from MSNBC and I turned it down and went uh, went with the uh, you know the Deeks Group and okay. uh, you know worked with Deeks because they were doing straight After Effects all the time. Yeah. So that was a uh, yeah. way to go. I remember the VHS taste when we're dating ourselves, but <laughs> been so, around a little while. How, how would you, how do you see like some of the guys coming out of school now? I mean, how has that changed from, of course they're not using VHS now. Everything's what web based. Uh, how are you getting a lot of some of these resumes coming in now? Yeah. I mean, I just get, uh, I just get links, links to the website, you know, yeah. I mean, um, you know, LinkedIn is pretty popular as well, but honestly, okay. I just, I don't really, I don't really look at, I look at LinkedIn like once a year, you know, really? um, but uh, I get hit up. I get hit up on Twitter. I get hit up on Instagram. Uh, I get you know email straight to straight to my email. But you know it's it's um you know for us the way we find people is is uh you know it's either speaking engagements, okay. it's uh, talking at colleges, you know meeting you know meeting kids you know just you know face to face, which is mm-hmm. which is awesome. And also, I've been teaching uh, teach at the, at the new school. Um, I've been teaching there since two thousand one. Okay, how's that going? So it's good. It's good. I, I think I'm officially I'm officially wrapping it up because. Uh, oh really? Yeah, it's just it's just too much. You know, I got uh, got these these jobs that are keeping me pretty busy. So mm-hmm. um, I decided that uh, maybe last year was 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 the wrap. But um, you know, I loved it. I mean, I love teaching. I love you know meeting new kids and seeing how excited they get and you know, introducing them to the to the business. So it's um it's going to be a little disappointing uh, to do it. Maybe maybe I'll come back to it in a year or two once everything sort of yeah. settles. Yeah. But right now I got my I got my hands full. Okay. Because I know then right after this, you because you were doing nail gun for a long time. That's how I met you. Yeah. You, you were running yeah. nail gun. Yeah, it's funny when uh, like when I left uh, the Deeks Group. Um, you know, I worked with a guy named uh, Eric Vanderwald, okay. and uh, him and I decided to leave and start our own company. You know, mm-hmm. Brian was merging with another company, and we thought, you know, let's do something on our own. So we left and uh, basically started. Um, you know. Started working on my apartment. I had an apartment, and uh, you know, him and I just uh, worked on a business plan and started the company and uh, and did that for about a year there. And we sort of we, we blinked. You know, we were five people. You know, uh, really quick. We had a producer and had two uh, you know, students of mine who were were okay. great. And uh, they started working there freelance. And and yeah, you know, we started pitching some jobs. And uh, actually, funny enough, Nickelodeon was our first client. You know, we had done some work with them uh, before and. You know, they reached out to us, and then uh, we had an, an advertising rep and started doing some work for like I think maybe like a month. Then we did like ten spots for uh, you know for McCann Erickson, you know Lowe's mm-hmm. Home Improvement. So that got us that got us you know going right away. So it was great. So we did that for about a year, and then then found a new spot. So like Nick and um, these other companies, you did you meet them while you were working at the Deeks Group or Nick was the only one I had, I had met with you know okay. with them at the Deeks Group. They they done some work and and um and they really you know liked us and you know they. Um, you know, we, we, when we left, you know, I tried to be, you know, as legit as possible about it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't reach out to any of my clients. You know, I was like, you know, if I wanted to keep working for the same clients, I would have stayed there. So okay. we just, uh, went on our own and started reaching out to people we wanted to work with. And as we we're doing that, you know, the rumor got around that we had left. That's okay. how, how Nickelodeon found us. Um, 
So that was great. And then we started working with them. But everybody else was pretty much brand new clients. You know, we started doing some some spec work, you know, just to kind of, you know, you know, kind of beef up the reel a little bit. But luckily, you know, we, we, we started, you know, turning a profit very quickly. So, cool. yeah, so it was great. But it was, it was tough because you, you do work and some of the work, you know, advertising work isn't as sexy as some of the yeah. other things. And so you do that. And, uh, you know, as I say, uh, you know, w- uh, one for the meal and one for the real. And so you do some things and you're like, well, I can't really show this because it's, it's not exactly what I want to put out there, you know, right. initially. But um, we had a little bit of that. But then we're doing some cool stuff as well. So that was exciting. So what do you, what was the time frame? do you think, when you left to the oh, time you got your first client? Yeah, I, uh, I'd say probably a week or two. Really? It's pretty quick. It's wow. Pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Man. I mean, you know, the one thing is like, the one thing, you know, when we did the business plan, we actually met with, um, you know, some, some uh, you know, we went to this company, uh, SBA Small Business Association. Okay. And they have a, a, a specific division called SCORE, and it was for, you know, for people who are trying to get started. And we met with them, and, you know, they just kept emphasizing, you know, having a rainmaker. And uh, we were lucky because uh, the, uh, the advertising rep that repped uh, us at the other company, they had, they had left maybe about four or five months before. Okay. Uh, and quit repping, uh, quit repping him. And then when we started a company, you know, we reached out to them and they were like looking for an East Coast company. So they took us on, which is great and helped a lot. And then our plan was for Eric to, uh, to actually, you know, go out and, and do sales. Um, and, you know, that, that's what we started doing initially. But then we got so busy, we just, neither one of us could do that because we were very hands on. So we right. just started working. So that, that's and, when you uh, started reaching out, getting freelancers in and producers and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, we so had to right ex- away. Explain Rainmaker. So Rainmaker is somebody who brings the work to you. You okay. know, no matter how good you are, you got to have somebody who brings work. Yeah. And uh, no matter how great, you know, good work does bring work, but you you still have to reach out. And um, you know, I'm not, you know, that's not me. I'm not a sales guy. I'm not great in that situation. Right. And Eric, you know, was an actor back in the day, so he's very good at sort of like, you know, starting stimulating conversations with people. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, I, I'm probably more the closer in terms of kind of coming in and meeting with people and. and you know, trying to show the work and really being passionate about what we do. But, uh, but you got to have somebody who's constant at their working. So I think probably maybe um, two years in, you know, we, we met with Brett Ashey and, uh, okay. and Brett took us on as a client and, uh, and he repped us. And it was great. The first time we met, we met with Brett. We, you know, we went to Promax uh, BDA, which is a big conference, you know, in the TV hmm. business. And, um, and he, he set us up with ESPN and we had lunch with ESPN and, and he was the first person to really, you know, explain to somebody who we were and what we did. And, and you know, a lot, there's a lot of motion graphics companies out there, but everybody has a, a specific niche and everybody has a, okay. what makes them great. And he got us right away. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we picked up ESPN as a client and uh, that was like our biggest client, you know, the whole time for the whole nine years at Nailgun. Really? Very yeah. cool. Yeah, it was great. Now, when you when you talk about like going back to the Rainmaker thing and when you had the Ashley group come in. Uh, was there like a finder's fee that you guys had to pay? I mean, how did that, that work? I mean, obviously they weren't doing this for free for you guys. Sure, sure. No, I mean, you know, uh, Brett Ashey and his, his company, you know, I think with every salesperson, you basically, you know, it's, it's a, it's, you, sometimes you pay like a monthly fee. Sometimes you pay like a, you know, a percentage. You know, I think mm-hmm. the, the average is probably between, you know, five to 10%, you know, okay. on, on the job. Um, you know, so, you know, if, to me, it's like if you're bringing in the work, you know, that, that, that little percentage, you know, is, is, is worth, you know, bringing in the work, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, as long as you're busy, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're paying, paying him and, and when you're not busy, then, you know, you're not paying. So, but, um, you know, it, it just depends, depends on the rep. It depends on who you are as a company, you know, uh, you have like what's called schedule A's, which is when you bring, you have clients that you already have. So if, if work comes in, then, you know, that's your client, you don't have to pay for that. Right. So, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's usually between like five to 10%. You know, or they pay a monthly fee. A oh, monthly fee. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then how, how long you guys ran nine gun, uh, nail gun for what? Nine years. Nine years. Nine years was great. I mean, we you know we there's a point where I think at our at our largest it was uh, 22 people, mm-hmm. and on average we were about 12 to 15. You know, between okay. you know uh, full time staff and what we call permalancers, which is uh, freelancers that come in and never go home. Right. And uh, so, like, you know, they're freelance, but they, uh, they, but they work with you all the time. So, um, yeah, we were, we, we, you know, it was a pretty good size, you know. That was a good size where we could attack a bunch of jobs, but, uh, but not so big that we had to take everything that came, came our way. We'd always try to be a little bit picky about, mm-hmm. you know, the jobs that we were, you know, going to take on as a client. Right. Because, I mean, I know some businesses who also do freelance, and the best, the great thing about that, like, if things slow down, you can kind of, 
cut back. On yeah, you can let them too yeah, much and go away for a little bit. Kind yeah. of bring everybody back. But I think the cool thing about design is, I mean, some of these guys, they just bounce around so much, yeah. which is cool. Yep, yep. They, um, yeah, it's a, you know, it's it's good and bad. You know, I think you know you want to have a rhythm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, the the problem, you know, the difficulty in our business is that things happen so fast, and so you got to have a good rhythm. You know, in terms of how you work. So when you have people who know how you work and they like the system, and you know, everybody works so differently. You know that that's that's great. You know, somebody comes in, they 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 contact you, and they say, hey, we need you to pitch something in two days. You know, there's no time. You know, there's mm-hmm. no time to really to really think. So you have to at least you know kind of work quickly and, and uh, you know, and sort of make it happen. So when you get freelancers, it's a little bit tougher in that sense, you know, but if you have staffers, like everybody has like shorthand and right. kind of know what you're trying to do. Um, and then, you know, and also if you're trying to find somebody freelance, you have to call around and you have, you know, it's just a whole complicated process. So it's good to have freelancers, but you can't live off of that. And I think a lot of people nowadays try to live off of it, you know, where right. they try to keep the overhead really small. Mm-hmm. And then the problem with that is you keep it really small. And then when you have to staff up, it's just, it's, it's tough. And 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 uh, I don't think it really warrants good work because you know you don't you know if people are good they're not they're not free they're not available right. so you know if you need somebody last minute you know it's hard to find great talent right yeah, already, it makes sense yeah makes sense so then I, mean, I know a lot of people who want to start a business um, I mean that, that's such a hard thing to do and then to be able to keep it be successful so, for so long yeah um, I mean what made you want to kind of just hang it up go back into the like the w2 side of things <laughs> the w2 side <laughs> uh you know it's it's um God, it's like the, it's like the, the million dollar question people always ask me about you know what's it like having a boss again you know but you always have a boss you always have mm-hmm. a client right. but uh what i think you know it was nine years and and eric and i had worked together for for 13 okay you know and uh, it was almost like a marriage you know in a way and uh and i love the guy to death but uh at some point you know you know uh you got to try something new and i think for us right. that that year it was um, it was complicated because uh, we had our best year the last year. We were looking a year from us closing. We were looking for new space. We were looking to expand because you know we we were paying for twenty three hundred square feet and uh, and it was really about sixteen hundred square feet. And okay. when you start getting up to twenty people, that's that's a lot. Right. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of people in a small space. So we were looking for more space, but um, it was hard to, to find the right location. Half our staff was in Brooklyn. Half was in New Jersey. And so we were centrally located, had a great location, mm-hmm. um, and we just couldn't find a, a number that sort of fit, you know. It was like, you know, we were going to take on maybe a third more space and doubling our rent, you know, um, right. because of where the economy was. So um, so we ended up staying where we were, but we kind of became a victim of our own success. You know, what was happening was that, um, you know, in the old days we'd have, you know, six, seven jobs, you know, and, you know, the, the last job would pay for the newest job. and. Okay. You know, you always had money kind of coming in, but as we got bigger and more successful, we had bigger jobs, and um, we get into situations where, uh, you know, we'd be waiting on payment, and uh, uh, you know, so you you know, you you could have a million dollars in accounts receivable, you know, thirty thousand dollars is in the bank in cash, and payroll is fifty grand every two weeks, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just really tough, you know, because the only way you can sort of like survive that is by taking out more loans than Eric and I never really wanted to. And we didn't right. have some sort of financial backing. It was just, you know, his company and my company. Okay. So uh, that last year was just really tough. And there was a lot of stress, you know, that was going on at the time with that. The economy was kind of bad at the time. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in my personal life with health issues with me and and, uh, and my wife at the time. So it was a lot. And uh, that year was a tough year to get through. And, uh, you know, near, the, near that summer, we had a couple companies, two companies that were trying to, trying to, uh, you know, they wanted to buy us. Okay. And we negotiated on one, got pretty close, and then you know they got cold feet, and the other one, you know, just wasn't in a big rush. And uh, that summer, we were, I was working one night. There's maybe like four of us, uh, and we we're on the the fourth floor, on Twenty Second Street, and maybe ten o'clock at night, we're working, and all of a sudden, you know, I go to the go to the bathroom, and right next to the bathroom is the internal staircase, and I could hear water like, just coming down the staircase. And I was like, what, what's, what's going on? It sounds like water running. And then I could smell like a little bit of smoke. So I go to the front of the studio where the 3D you know, room was, and they're like, are you smelling smoke? I'm like, yes. Yeah. So we open up the window and like look out the window, and there's flames shooting out from two floors up. So we're like, oh, oh crap, the shit. building's fire. So we run out of the building, open up the, the, stair, to the staircase, water's flooding out the space. We run downstairs, and uh, we call you know, 911, and you know the fire department shows up and sprays the you know the, the place down upstairs, flooded out our whole studio. Like it all, all the water just came down in our studio. Right. Um. So, uh, you know, 
we, we went back into the studio after the fire was out and literally there's just like water dripping on brand new IMAX and you know the server room in the back and and with all that craziness we we lost one piece of equipment which was an Epson printer that IMAX fired up the next day perfectly all the machines worked fine but in like the next couple couple months we were working in you know holes in the walls you know dehumidifiers running right it just it was just madness and uh, so you know it was just a lot going on and then uh, you know, at that point, I had a conversation with one of my clients, uh, Kim, over at uh, over at TV Land, and they had a position available, and she, you know, offered it to me. And at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, I have a company, and and uh, then I really thought about it. I was like, you yeah, know, this could be cool. This could be something different, you know. Right. And, and uh, one of the good things about going there was that they they did you know really fun work, and and everybody there was super cool, and uh, they always treated us really well as a as a client, you mm -hmm. know, uh, paying on time taking care of us if there was like overages that kind of thing so uh you know i i decided you know what i can go there and i feel like if i hire friends of mine as a vendor that like i know we'll treat them right and not you know make them wait 90 days for pay and all that kind of stuff and right. and uh so i decided yeah let's let's take the leap and eric and i had the conversation and uh we i made the decision on a monday and by friday i called around to friends of mine and and uh Found jobs for all my, all the employees, mm -hmm. and uh, the following, following Sunday night, we we wrapped it up, and uh, I started at TV Land the following Monday. Really, straight to work. Yeah, <laughs> they were they were in the process of, make, of working on logos for a rebrand, and okay, and that's one of the reasons why they wanted me to come over was to uh, to help with this new rebrand and positioning, and I didn't want to miss out on on the logo design, so yeah. I went there right away, and uh, and off we went. You know, not a day missed. So yeah, and it was good. I mean, yeah. I mean, the work that you guys are doing over there is crazy. Yeah. As well. I mean, how how different do, would you say it is from working on your own to now being at, at TV Land? It's um, yeah, it's it's really different. I mean, I think you know the the good part about working on your own is that you know if you make a decision, you make a decision. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the one of the best parts is that you have this. You know, as, if you build the company the right way and you hire the right employees, you know, you have a great little family, right. and uh, and I love those guys to death, all of them, and. Um, you know, we actually, you know, probably once every year or so we get together and have like a little reunion, have dinner okay. and, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's great. And, um, but, um, you know, the, the bad part about it is, you know, is that it's, it's all on your shoulders, you know? Yeah. And so to me, I just wanted to focus on the work and I never really wanted to be a business owner per se. Um, but that's the sort of thing that people don't know or don't realize right away. It's like, they just think, Oh, I'm going to run a company and a company doesn't run itself. So what happens is that you spend more time, uh, you know, running the company than you do doing, doing what you were passionate about to begin with, mm -hmm. you know. So I never wanted to do that. So I, even after nine years, I was super hands-on, still designing, um, you know. And, and, uh, and there was a point where I think I realized that last year where it just got to be too much. And I knew I couldn't let go of it. And we got to a situation where, like, for a long time, my, my job was creative director by day, you know, almost like a superhero. Creative director by day till six, have dinner. Seven o'clock, you became a designer, and you would design till nine, ten, eleven, one o'clock in the morning. Right. So I did that for a long time, and and then we got to be so so busy and so big that there was always somebody in the studio. So at night, I, I couldn't start designing till ten, eleven o'clock at night because I was still being creative director, and uh, and so I had to figure out a new way. And so what I was doing is about once once every two weeks, I would uh, I'd go home at you know I'd, I'd work creative director from nine thirty to six eat, work till like around nine, you know, it's creative director. I'd leave, go home, you know, see my wife, be in bed by 11, go to sleep, wake up at three, shower, leave at 3.30, be back in the office by four, and from four to nine, I had five hours of, of design where Time I was work. fresh, and nobody was around, and I could could do my thing. And I was doing that, and I just realized, <clears> you know what, this is this is a bit much. You know, this is a bit much. It's, mm -hmm. it's too much. And, uh, that's when I realized, like, you know, this isn't sustainable, you know. So uh, I knew I had to had to make a change somehow. And now, now you got paid vacation, holiday. Paid vacation, 401K, insurance. 401K, yes, yeah, man. insurance. That's when you know you're old, man, when like, the 401K gets you excited. Oh, um, no, you know what it is yeah. when you, the insurance, man. That's the thing. When they start changing the insurance at the job and you're complaining, hey, why is it ER now $100 instead of 50 yeah, That's yeah, when you yeah. know you're getting old. <laughs> Dude, we you know, we went. You know, I think one of the things that was hard about us at Nailgun was that like we, you know, our our setup was like you, know, you started to work full time. After six months, we paid half your insurance. 
they paid half of it. After a year, we paid full insurance. Mm-hmm. A lot of small companies didn't do that, and our, our you know, our accountant thought we were crazy. But we wanted to, to a that for them to have insurance, and b that was that was part of the, one of the, the the perks of like not being freelance. Um, and there, the end, man. It was it just every year it went up. It was like four hundred dollars a month for a single person. Yeah. You know, first it was three fifty. Then it worked its way up to four hundred, four twenty for single. For a, a couple, it was uh, you know eight hundred. Mm-hmm. And then for a family, whether you had one kid or sixteen kids, went up to sixteen hundred yeah. a month. And you know, and we weren't paying that that part. We were we were paying the single. But you know, if you're if you're an employee and you have a wife and a kid, uh, you know your insurance goes from eight hundred to sixteen hundred. That's a huge chunk of your your, your payroll every um, of your your paycheck every two weeks. Yep. So that was hard, man. Like I mean, having a small company was really really difficult, you know, in that in that sense. And um, so those are the kind of things where it's just like you just don't, you know, you have an idea, you know. I mean, we helped run, you know, the Deeks Group as a company, you know, mm-hmm. the last couple of years, but we didn't know the specifics. Right. And I always joke, you know, it's like you have to be dumb enough to start a company, you know. You have to be smart enough to know what you're doing, but dumb enough to, like, not realize all the details. Because if you knew all the details, you would just, you know, you know, you would just, you just wouldn't do it, you know. But uh, I'm glad I did it. I, I, you know, people ask me, the, first, the second question I always get, would you do it again? And I'm like, no, I have no interest because I care too much about the work. and I enjoy doing the work. And that's the best thing at TV Land and Nick is that, like, you know, I get to be hands-on. You know, I get to direct stuff and I get to, you know, be involved with the shoots and, and, you know, design as much as I used to, but I, I like the directing aspect of it and I really like influencing that and I really like developing people. So, you know, now, now that I'm working for somebody, I get to do all that versus, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, run the company and, and, you know, and trying to find the work and, you know, how you bring jobs in and, you know, do you meet with clients and, you know, all those, all those things. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I just, I go into work and do my job and it's fun. So. Yeah, very cool. It. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that insurance thing. And my son, he, he just got out of his second cast today. Oh man! He broke his uh his he broke his arm in February playing with his cousins. <laughs> broke his elbow. So he cast six weeks. He was out of the cast for a month and a half. After soccer practice, he's on the playground. Took a a dive off the playground. Broke his other arm. <sighs> so Dude, that's literally my story. And like in in eighth grade, I broke my left arm uh, skateboarding and got out of it. And then maybe about two months later, I broke my right arm skateboarding. And the doctor's like, dude, I'm going to give your mom a do-at-home kit just because to, to, it will be cheaper. Really? See, and, uh, yeah. See, in 2016, you're worried about child services coming into the ER, <laughs> asking what the, you know, what's going on at your house. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly. It's a little different than when we were kids. It's pretty crazy, man. Yeah. So, I mean, over the years now, uh, reinventing yourself. I mean, yeah. what, what's, what's changed you think for yourself over the years? I mean, what are you doing differently now? What are you, the experiences that you've had since leaving VCU yeah. to now? I mean, you obviously still have that drive, uh, which I think is cool. You know, yeah. stay, still, you're still in the industry. I mean, because yeah. even now, um, I'm, I'm, my just personality, man, I just want to keep trying yeah. so many new different things. Uh, I think that's, you know, with, with you, I mean, what have you done you know, just to keep the passion and just kind of reinvent yourself to kind of keep going? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's weird, because I was talking to someone about this yesterday, it's like, you know, I knew in middle school really? that I wanted to have a design company, you know, okay. I didn't know exactly what that meant, you know, like, I, I just knew I wanted to have a design company, and I want to be an artist, and, uh, you know, and I was luckily, once again, to be dumb enough to, like, not really know what all that meant, and, and to not know if there was really a job for me, and I just knew that that's the one thing I was good at, you know, right. I was... I was decent at sports. I was a good, good athlete, but I was great at like drawing and great at design stuff. And, so uh, in, in class you join like comic book characters? Told, no, not, no, it's weird. I was a skateboarder. So like okay. I didn't draw comic book tar- characters. I, I drew like, you know, the rat bones logo. I drew, you know, I made my own logo. I, I made a lo- logo for my buddy and, you know, I was drawing type, you know, like not really, really it was really tight. I was drawing like that kind of stuff, making logos. Okay. Um, you know, I used to, you know, I didn't really, you know, I, I grew up with no money. So like, uh, you know, I, you know, I always had my, my mom, my, my mom was one of the smartest people I've ever met. Like she, she got by by raising a kid and never paying one dime to, to a babysitter, you know, like she found jobs for me all the time. Really? So like, she's like, why well, pay somebody when they can pay my son to do something for them? Uh, and uh, I love her to death. I mean, she, she's the one who put, you know, she's the one that got that work ethic in me, like in a very young age. So, you know, I had all these really, you know, shit jobs early on from cleaning up the, uh, 
you know, uh, the weekend after the flea market, cleaning up the, the parking lot the trash to having mm -hmm. paper routes to working on a chicken farm to working in fast food you know like i always had a job so you know to me like my outlet was was skateboarding and playing sports and, and drawing and uh you know so i w really wasn't making any money doing any of those kind of crap jobs so what i would do is that i would always i be, sort of became popular in my group because i could build things so i built like a lot of ramps and stuff okay and I was a decent skateboarder, but I also uh, became really popular because back in the day, you would you would draw on your grip tape. You know, right. you would make logos or draw things on your grip tape, and you know that was kind of what set you apart from other people. You know, because you'd see the you know you always see the top of somebody's board. People be like, "Yo, like your your grip tape is dope." And so I would I would do other people's grip tape and, and charge them money to do their grip tape. You know, do some stuff on their grip tape, and so I made some extra extra scratch that way. So I was always kind of an entrepreneur, like doing weird stuff, you know, right. to try to make some make some cash. But um, so that, that that I went from doing that to, you know, being in class and just drawing all the time. Really? Oh, uh, and my friends were like, "Dude, like, how can you, you know, get an A or B on that test when like the whole time you were like doodling?" And I'm like, "I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I'm listening. I'm paying yeah. attention, but at the same time, I'm I'm, I'm drawing, you know. So, uh, you know, so I just kept doing that, and I got lucky. I, I you know, in high school, we um, maybe the year before I got into high school, they they made the high school I was supposed to go to a magnet school, and I was okay. considering going to another high school to play soccer. So that was the sport you were playing with soccer? Yeah, well, I, I you know I played everything, but it, once I got to middle school, I was I played soccer and, and mostly soccer and basketball, and I really loved soccer. And um, so when I got to you know, I think my uh, my last year in middle school, uh, I, I broke my arm and I missed like a third of the season because I had a broken arm. They wouldn't let me play with a cast, mm -hmm. and so I played the sec the second and third part of the season. And ended up getting a uh, you know like second team, you know, uh, like I was a second team all star, and uh, and I was you know playing only half the season. I was pretty good, and then I got to high school and I had to make that decision you know about because my high school team soccer team was terrible, right. and, um, and I didn't want to go across town to uh, Patrick Henry the other school. So then they started the magnet school, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I can, for three hours in the morning, go to art school. And so that's what I did. And uh, that was really helpful because I think it uh, it really opened my eyes to, like, a lot of different types of design and art, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and uh, Mr. Ferris, who was my teacher, was, you know, you know, we'd do stuff, and you'd draw on, like, put a real stuff. And he'd be like, yeah, that's cool, but, like, that's what cameras are for. You know, try something else. So it really made me experiment and think, cool. and think differently. So, um yeah, that's that's basically you know at that point I knew I wanted to go to school for art and uh, you know VC, I applied to a couple schools and VCU was the the closest and in state and was the cheapest and um, and that, that's that's where I went. Mm -hmm. What you you graduated? Uh, ninety four. Ninety four. Yeah. We might have been there one year together then. Hmm. What year? What year? What years were you there? I graduated in ninety eight. Okay, there might be some overlap. I, I actually didn't. I didn't. I take that back. I graduated. Um, I stayed an extra semester and got a minor in art history. So I, I think I graduated. Uh, yeah, Christmas of '94. So did you stay on campus, or what'd you do? Yeah, the first year I was in Johnson Hall. All right. Then I went to GRC for uh, a year, and then the n next year I kind of lived with a girlfriend for a while, and then uh, and I lived. Uh, and then I lived. Uh, uh, in the fan for a year as well. Yeah, so I did. I did. Ro Rhodes Hall was our place. That's too fancy for me. Was it? <laughs> yeah, you guys had AC. We didn't have AC. <laughs> did. Hall was there. Our 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 dorm. I did GRC too. You on the which side? The one with the kitchen or the other side? Uh, gosh, I don't know what's that mean with the kitchen. Because we had a kitchen in our in our in our uh, dorm. No, we didn't have a kitchen. Okay, then you're on the right That's side. Yeah. Because yeah. you know what happened that that next year when I went to GRC. Uh, I went in the lottery, and the roommate was the nephew of the dean. So okay. we had every fixture. Everything was working <laughs> perfectly, and he had a nice. corner unit. Okay. So the corner unit was huge. So I just squatted on that thing. Once nice. after that, yeah, I got my friends in there. We just hung out there for like the, <laughs> the rest of the time there. That's nice. Yeah, so, GRC, good times. Yeah, GRC was very cool. That was a fun spot. Very cool. So, what the hell did you do on a farm? You said you were working on a farm. Uh, my my uh, my mom's cousin had a chicken farm. So one summer, my mom was like, "Hey, you should go work on this on this chicken farm." 
and it was the most brutal thing ever. Like you, you harvest like, the chickens? N- well, no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was like a big warehouse with like right. all these cages of chickens, and you had to, and it was middle of summertime, so it was like you know inside it's probably like hundred degrees. You had to wear jeans because of a chicken. So basically, the, the idea was that you you reach into a cage and you pull out a couple of chickens and shove them into this cage that you had to roll to the, to the truck so they could okay. take them away to, to to harvest them. And uh, and if you dropped one, the chicken of course attacks you and scratch the crap out of your legs. You had to wear jeans. It's super hot, and and I'm there with like all these crazy people and uh, and not fitting in whatsoever. And yeah, I did that you know like about a month or so. And just told him I was like, I can't go back there. It's just, it was just brutal. It's like the worst job ever. But you know, the best part about it, man, is that, you know, when you set that standard, like, like here's what a, a real crap job is, right, you know, right. like, you know, like how bad it can be. You, you work harder to make sure you get as far away from that as, as humanly possible. So, yeah, man. We yeah. grew up, we had chickens growing up. I must, she still has chickens. <laughs> Remember one time we had, we had like 12 chicks and six of them ended up being roosters. Okay. My mom's like, uh, you got to take care of them, and I was just like, Ugh. and I, I couldn't do it, man. I, I eventually I did. Yeah. I remember seeing my dad. My dad, I, I tease him because he's Puerto Rican, and he went full native on me because he, <laughs> I'm, I got the chicken, we got him on the the block of wood, and I got the hatchet in my hand. Oh and I, no. I'm like, uh, uh. No. He's like, just give me that thing. He just went whack, and I was just like, yeah. I, I had that chicken in my freezer for maybe three months. I, I couldn't eat it. Yeah. It was like it's... it was. It's it's the real deal, man. You you think after that I would never eat chicken again, but right. chicken's too good, you know. It's uh, I couldn't say no to it. But uh, when you when you when you watch, you know how the, how they how you know, now you got the free range stuff. So like you know you don't have like a you know those little containers would be like you know twelve inches high by three inches wide by three inches deep, and you'd have like eight chickens in there. Really, the, the hole to pull them out was probably maybe about eight inches, and because you had to be fast, you had to grab two legs at a time. So it's two chickens. So imagine pulling two chickens through like an eight inch by eight inch square as they're flapping their wings going crazy. And you're pulling them out of there and then you got to shove them into the same hole that, that rolls, you know, and it was just, and then also these got there's like chicken shit on the ground and it picks up feathers and that gets in the wheels and you got to push this cart, you know, uh, you know, 30 they yards. They stink, man. Oh, that, they stink. that chicken shit stinks. Oh, and it's, you know, hundred degrees. It uh, doesn't smell good. doesn't smell good. But I knew after that, I was like, this is where this is how bad it can be. <laughs> so at that point, working three jobs at a time was uh, was a piece of cake. That's cool. I'm surprised you, you get a balcony, man. You get a couple chickens. You can get some get your eggs going. <laughs> I don't even need eggs, so that doesn't work for me either. No, uh, but very cool. I mean, so I'm trying to think. Just even the time with myself just changing. I mean, I think coming out of school, mo- moving up to New York was was pretty intense. Kind of hopping yeah. around. That's when. Manhattan transfer was around. Yeah. Um, kind of just to get your head around. I think shit just back then was well, pretty crazy. It, back then, was, I mean, it was a crazy time because you know, like After Effects wasn't like a legit thing yet. Right. You know, people were playing with it and they were doing like little elements and small stuff, and then you would take it. I remember, you know, we we would do a lot of work with TNT, and uh, we would build a lot of stuff, and then we would take it to Manhattan transfer, and we'd sit in a in a you know in a session room. And then give it to the team there on a drive, and then they would go into the smoke or the flame or the inferno, and they would start putting all your stuff together and, right. and making it all real time. You know, it's great because you could turn things around really, really fast. But um, you know, you're at the hands of some some random person in this room, and and uh, you know, but it was for me, it was really eye opening because I was used to not having anything working for a news station where like you know just you just had nothing to going from there to working in a session where, you know, halfway through the day that the masseuse would come in and, you know, give people shoulder massages really? and that person would leave. And then two hours later they bring in like the freshly baked cookies and you'd eat some cookies. And man, it's like, this is, a, this is life, you know? And, uh, and you know, you would order food and that would come, you know, from whatever place and you would eat that. And I was like, man, this is actually not, not too shabby. Um, but, uh, that was, it was a different time then, you know, that I remember Manhattan transfer had a full time chef, you know, that they would cook and you could either go in and, and order something from there or uh, you can go off the menu and have something delivered to you, you know. And uh, it's back when people had budgets, you know. Nowadays, those we didn't budgets get none don't of that exist. shit, <laughs> We got, what do we get? We got the Cipro attack. That's what we had a, when that shit happened there. What is that? Remember when, uh, it was after 9 11, when uh, uh-huh. the anthrax letter was sent to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was on our floor. No way. And then we had to, um, 
I remember finding out because I was staying with my grandmother, and it went along the ticker. I think it was on CNB because the stock market was doing great back then. Yeah, 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 of so course. CNBC, CNBC, I was always watching it. And on a ticker, it said anthracite exposure at a 30 Rock. I remember I was sitting next to my uncle, and I could feel him looking at me and like, <laughs> you need to get away from me. And I was like, <laughs> I was like freaking out. And of course, everything was shut down, so I couldn't get back into sure. the city. Yeah. And eventually, we did, and they brought the CDC in, and they sent us downstairs. I remember every, just – seeing everyone kind of freaking out and they lined everybody up and they sat us down and they took this like eight inch q-tip uh-uh. and kind of scratched the back of your brain okay that's better popped it in they gave us a, a week supply of cipro and they sent us on our way oh my god that's crazy huh? i don't know about that the cipro thing that's nuts you know, they gave us we on cipro for a week i remember heading home after what was bad about that is that but well, we were waiting of course i was freaking out so i didn't i didn't eat anything all day yeah and one of the ladies i was working with she's like look i live because i was heading back down to virginia that night she goes look i live right down here come down i'll, I'll make you something to eat so i was like, all right cool go to her place i eat i had allergic reaction to something that she made oh no right so i'm on the train heading down to msg to catch amtrak and my freaking armpits and my crotch are just itching like <laughs> what i'm like what the hell is going on and i go in the bathroom <laughs> And my face looked like the Hulk <laughs> in mid-chain. <laughs> I walk out and I see a police officer and I ask the guy, I says, you know, where is uh, the, the station so I can go get call help? And he looked at me. He must have thought I was on drugs, man. He didn't even bother. Yeah. Just dude, oh, man. Over there. I remember, again, because uh, you know the big escalators coming out of MS, MSG, right? Yeah, sure. So when the ambulance came to pick me up, they're walking me to the ambulance I get on the escalator and I'm just kind of hanging down. I was like, I turn around to tell them something. They're still waiting at the bottom. So I'm halfway up and they put like 30 feet between us. And then eventually <laughs> I finally got up there. And it, it was crazy. Dude, did you think like that was like an anthrax thing? Did you, thought that, did you think that was like what was happening to you at the time? Or did you know that it was? A yeah, we did know. Because we knew that. They, like I said, they found the powder. They, no, I'm saying like when you when you started like breaking out and like having all. Oh no, I knew I was having on. allergic reaction to something. Oh, okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, that would have, would have panicked. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, man. I, I I swelled up that my eyelids got so heavy I couldn't even open my eyes. It was uh, uh, pretty freaking insane. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't couldn't wouldn't change that either. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was an awkward time for sure. But, Insane. So, well, tell me about was exquisite corpse. Yeah, man. Um, so, yeah. Object. So it's weird. Uh, uh, I, you know, I've been, there's a conference in uh, was in Albuquerque, out in Santa Fe, called the Motion Conference. Okay. And uh, this was my eighth year speaking at this conference. And you know, I've spoken about you know a little bit of everything. I, you know, did a lot of sessions early on, and you know, one of the ones I did was uh, why designers and and artists are masochists, and it was a whole 20 minute TED Talk style thing about why are we so crazy that we just keep doing the same things over and over again, you know, uh, trying to win jobs and, mm-hmm. and, you know, if you're successful, you're, you're, you know, you get one out of three and, and, uh, you know, talking a little bit about, uh, you know, just wanting to be liked and, and people wanting to like your work and you know, how crazy of a concept that is, you know, and I think it was a very specific point of time for me, you mm-hmm. know, where I was probably feeling a little frustration about a lot of things and, so that's what that came about. And then I did a session where I talked about, you know, the, the 40 things I've learned, you know, uh, you know, as an artist, uh, that was another 20 minute sort of talk. And then, you know, uh, Elaine who runs the much conference with Becky, uh, asked me, they said, look, we want, you know, I want you to do something a little different this year, you know? And, and uh, they're like, you know, think about what you want to do and, and then come back to us. And so, uh, you know, we, I was, I just started at TV land. I've been there for maybe about a year and, I was like, well, you know, what can we do? And we talked about it internally, and we sort of talked about the idea of doing an exquisite corpse. And an mm-hmm. exquisite corpse is when you take a, a sheet of paper, and it's a game and, and with artists, and you take a sheet of paper, you fold it into four panels. And so one person takes the, the, the sheet, and they start on the first panel, they draw something on the panel, and then they hand it to somebody else, and somebody draws on the second panel, connecting the lines. Mm-hmm. And then they hand somebody else and it goes through four people. And so at the very end, you open up the sheet of paper and you have this beautiful collaborative drawing. Okay. Um, 
so we had tried to do that, you know, just as a group uh, with my people, you know, uh, at TV Land, and, and we did one on paper, and we made a huge one, you know, with like 16, 18 people and never finished it. So I was like, well, you know, what if we did an exquisite corpse that was like a video version of that, mm-hmm. where each person had three to five seconds, and they could do a piece of animation, and then somebody else would take that animation and connect it to theirs, and they had all these transitions and everybody looked at me like I was crazy because like we couldn't finish the the easy one. And now we're gonna try to do one in video, but that'd be really cool to do. And at the time, I was trying to learn learn my people at TV Land, and and I knew that, and I was starting to learn. You know, there's a lot of talent there, but it just hadn't really been been used. You know, the way it probably could have been used. And right. but that was a, you know, a huge opportunity to sort of like you know prove to the rest of the team of like how great a team we had developed there. Mm-hmm. So uh, so we did it, and. Um, and so we uh, we did a, a full blown piece, and and uh, you know I thought I didn't think we'd finish it honestly. I didn't think we'd definitely have everybody at the very end. Right. And there were artists within there that weren't designers or animators, and they teamed up with other people, and we made this 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 really great cohesive piece. And um, so I did that, and I presented it at the motion conference, and it went over really well. People really liked it, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And so next year, you know, motion asked me and said, "Well, do you want do you want to do another one?" Um, you know, or what do you want to do? I was like, yeah, I'll do another one, but I want to, I want to reach out to people and have people mm-hmm. work on it. So, you know, reach out to, uh, to, to, to vendors that we've used and, and some vendors that we hadn't used. And I reached out to friends of mine. And so we had people from around the world. It was South Africa, Korea, uh, Iceland, uh, LA, New York, um, you know, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I got 16 artists, you know, myself included and got them all on board. And, and we did this, another piece. And uh, and it was great, and we had a really good time doing it. And uh, you know, it was it was complex. We got to the end, and the audio person that was helping me uh, had to bail because they got a huge job and they just couldn't help him. So we scrambled and did the audio uh, with a friend of mine, this guy Ben Kell, and then also um, uh, you know John Wilkinson at work. You know, teamed up and we came with some really great music. So we did the second piece. Because I remember, I think, reading an article where you said, I think the audio was the hardest part for you guys. Totally was the hardest part. Well, it's, you know, it's just, it's just not what I do, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm good at audio. I know what I want. And, and it was just the fact that somebody bailed on me, you know, kind of yeah. late in the game that kind of just put a really big time constraint on it. And then we did a, a music version of it. And it, didn't, it just it didn't work, you know. Okay. It, was just, it was too seamless. So when you have all these, like, little three, five-second pieces, you need to be seamless in certain areas. You mm-hmm. need to be kind of choppy in others. So... We took the music and we sort of cut up the music and we went back and we did sound design across the board and then we started dropping the music where we thought it needed to be and to, to help the rhythm of it. And in the end, it, it worked out really great, but it was just, you know, we ended up doing it twice, you know, because I, I didn't like what it, what it was. Right. Um, and then that one, we, you know, we posted up on Vimeo as well, and that one got a, a staff pick and kind of blew up, um, which was really great. And uh, there was a lot of love for it. So then this year at Motion, was the tenth anniversary of the Motion Conference, and so they they talked to me about doing one that sort of, um, you know, that would that would sort of represent what Motion was all about, and and using you know mostly past speakers, and okay. reached out to a lot of people, and, and had you know some some people I thought were really great, and invited them, and so some other people who just were too busy to do it, and then so it was mostly Motion speakers, and then I brought some other some other people who I wanted to work with, and brought them on board as well. Now, when you say speakers, does that mean? So people who had spoken at the conference in the past. So they, they don't have like a broadcast background, like in After Effects then? Uh, the, the, those, the, who are the people I'm inviting for the project? Right, the speakers. Yeah, well, it, it's a mix. Because <clears throat> the thing about motion is that, you know, they'll, like, you know, it's like all these little TED Talks, but like one person might be uh, a musician. So it's anybody, anything about, that's kinetic in terms of, you know, the movement. Uh, right. You know, so one person might be a musician. One person might be a, a director. One person might be... Uh, a MoGraph person. One, so that, one, that musician, that, they would, were they responsible for shooting a video, or they have to come to you with a concept, and you guys worked out a concept, and you ended up? Well, we never. I didn't. I didn't invite any musicians to do a visual piece. Okay. I invited uh, a musician to help me score the whole piece in All the right. end. But everybody else was mostly, most a lot of MoGraph people, a lot of you know, a lot of people that um, you know, you know, that were more graphics based. But this year, I included uh, this guy Mike G, who's a director who I work with quite a bit. Um, he's a full-blown director, like a real director. And so the, the, one of the parts of the piece that, that made it a little bit different um, than, uh, you know, there was a, a project, you know, back in the day that was called uh, Pass It Along. And they were like these like little three-person three parts that were like um, 
you know, just purely graphics. And there was like a bunch of different ones. And so, um, you know, that was sort of like the first, I think probably the first really on air, this mm-hmm. was a corpse type thing. Okay. Um, but this one, I, you know, one of the, 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 there's a lot of different rules that I had sort of set forth for the team. And one of it was at three to five seconds in length. One of it was there had to be a live action component to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a, and the first two, there was a composition, uh, element to it as well. They had to, there had to be a certain composition at, some, at a certain point. Um, so I set these rules. And, uh, so that sort of limited who I could really reach out to because there had to be a live action component. So this year I wanted to have a real director involved who also did graphics and, and I try to mix up between companies and, and single artists and that kind of thing. So, um, part of the, my role as a director was finding the people, getting them to sign on, uh, connecting the people. And then we did this year, we did a little different. We actually had a, um, we had a Tumblr page, a private Tumblr page where we could post, you know, process, you know, okay. because I think in a perfect situation, this would be like a year long project. And, mm-hmm. uh, every three weeks, somebody would do their three to five seconds and hand it off. Um, but I just didn't have the time to do that. So we did, we all work kind of simultaneously. So, um, people had to talk to each other and we could see things on the Tumblr page and kind of see where people were starting to go in the beginning. And they would, sh- they would, they would show me style frames. They would show me you know, mood boards and I'd be like, Hey, I think this is where we should go. And I was sort of helping, you know, kind of take them into a direction and giving them feedback and saying yes or no. And then, and then at that point they started really working on, on, on design and on animation. Mm-hmm. So at some point, um, I started to get the pieces and we get the pieces and I worked with a guy, uh, at, at TV land, uh, this guy, Ryan O'Hare, who, mm-hmm. um, helped me put all of, all of it together. And, uh, so he, he was a person that kind of, you know, connected and, you know, they should, everybody should have one of the rules is that, you do your section, and then you design the transition out of your section into the next right. person. So you have a dialogue telling them, hey, this is what I'm planning to do to go into your section. And as long as everybody does that, then you don't have to do one transition because somebody does the one in the front. But not everybody exactly did that. So <laughs> we had to sort of build that ourselves um, in some of the sections. And, and uh, you know, and I, think it, I think it looks, you know, you want to be seamless. You want to be pretty seamless if you can. Um, so, yeah, so we did that. And then I... Uh, you know, I always, my section is always a little bit weird because I have to be like the intro and the outro. So I okay. actually have two sections. Yeah. And, and, you know, I can't just like blaze right into it, you know. I, I need to sort of like kind of get us into it, ease us in, and then take off and let things run. And then I sort of close it up. And then there's a credit page at the end. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more work than, than everybody else in some ways. And um, one of the guys at work, Chris, uh, Chris Wolfong, is one of the directors slash DPs, uh, TV Land. And he's been the guy who's who DP'd the last two pieces that I did uh, of my sections, and so it was a lot of fun. We mixed it up this year, and you know, uh, made it a little bit a little bit more organic than it was in the past. Mm-hmm. You can do another one next year? Nope. That's it too. I'm done. I did the trilogy, man. One and two and three. I'm done. I'm out. Uh, I presented it at Motion, and and a huge part of my presentation because I, I present it, but I also have like a 25 minute talk that kind of goes along with it. Okay. And I talk a lot about trilogies, and uh, you know, and that's that's it. I'm done. You know, I, I did three, you know, and, and I love them. I think they're really great, and and they're really fun pieces. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work coordinating 16 artists over the the span of roughly three to four months. So uh, especially when you have you know multiple jobs, you know, that's your that's your day job. So I mean, I, I'm I love it. I'm glad I did it. But um, you know, it's not time to move on to to the next challenge. You know. So what do you do to decompress then, man? Like outside of design, I mean, what do you man, what are you to keep yourself um, busy? You know, I like to travel a lot. You know, I mean, I travel a lot for work, so that you know, that's one thing. But I do like to travel personally as well, just to sort of get remotivated. Yeah. Um. You know, also I, I snowboard a lot, so okay. snowboard, play basketball. Um. You know, those are my athletic things. Kind of that kind of get me get me out there. But yeah, travel is a big thing. Like I went to two years ago. I went. To, I've been trying to go to Tokyo for a long time. You know, so I've, I've been around the globe, luckily, you know, and seen a lot of places. And Tokyo has been high on my list. And uh, actually, Victor and I wanted to go together. We would well, try to go one time, but then the earthquake happened, so we didn't go. We ended up going to uh, to yeah, Korea. Earthquake, Fukushima. Yeah. It's enough yeah. to keep you away. Gnarly. So we went to uh, we went to Seoul and made the mistake of going in July when it was monsoon season. So literally oh. straight for seven days, except for two hours on one day and two hours on another day. But two summers ago, I went to Tokyo for the first time, and uh, and it was just it was a game changer. You know? Was it? Just, oh, it's, it's, you know, you go to a lot of, a lot of big cities around the world and they're all kind of similar mm-hmm. and everybody speaks English, you know? And so 
um, you don't, you're not really out of your, out of your, your norm in some ways. Okay. Um, we went to Tokyo and just, you know, the 12 hour difference and, um, and Tokyo itself is six times larger than New York city. So it's huge. Um, and it's just a different world. You know, they, they are so true to their culture and, um, you know, and, and it's just, it's great. You get to experience it and you get to see it. It's, it's, uh, it's so hot there. It's, uh, really? you know, it's so crowded, you know, it's just, um, it's just, it's just different. And, you know, I grew up, you know, I grew up, um, you know, loving animation and mm. definitely loving Japanese animation. So to go there and really just see that world I'd always, you know, seen in movies and seen in, in animation was just, um, was amazing. One of my favorite cartoons growing up was, uh, I don't know if you know it or not, uh, Battle of the Planets. You remember that? Oh. So it was, uh, it was, um, it was originally called, it's originally called, uh, Gatchaman, which was, uh, the, 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 the name, uh, in Japan. And what happened was that like in the early eighties, TBS needed programming. So they started reaching out and finding like kind of weird stuff. And so they found, uh, this, this one show called space giants, which was a right. Japanese show and they redubbed it super cheesy, you know, almost like a power, power Rangers kind of thing. But, uh, about the planets was they took the gotcha series, which was actually more adult kind of animation where people were like getting killed and stuff. Right. And, uh, they took it and they uh, they cut it up and took out all the, the, the extreme violent stuff and and then brought it over to TBS and then, and they they revoiced it. And the problem was is that when they cut it all up, they, it came up short in a half an hour. So uh, what they did was that they made some new animation that was this character that was sort of intro, almost like a bumper. So he kind of came back from a break, he'd bump you back into the show. And I remember even as a kid being maybe like, you know, nine or 10 years old watching this and the animation didn't match up. And I was like, why does this not match up? Like, it looks so weird. It was like this, like really bad R2-D2 knockoff. And as a Star Wars fan, like I was like kind of insulted that like they would knock off R2-D2. Um, but the rest of the show was amazing. And I didn't learn until 20 years later on IMDb that the reason why that character existed to set up the show was to fill the gaps for all the stuff they had edited out. So when uh. you know, finally... You know, I finally bought the DVDs when they came out online and uh, and watched the real deal. And you're like, yeah, people people were getting killed <laughs> like in these cartoons. So yeah, you couldn't really show that on TBS. So because I'm looking at it now, I, I, yeah, it looks like Voltron ripped them off. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm pretty sure they came before Voltron. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely a similar similar style, definitely it's, similar it's illustration like style. I'm looking at it. They right they now. they all come together like they, they they were like these sort of bird people. Right. Kind of come together to make this big phoenix, and that was like their ship, and that's how they would get around and stuff. And so you had these like little characters, and uh, and yeah, it was it was just for me as a kid, it was just so different. Like I was used to like kitty cartoons, and like this was yeah. like legitimate dramatic you know TV show. Um, you know, and the only thing I really, you know, at the time, the only thing that kind of was even similar to that to me was like Johnny Quest. Like I, right. I grew up loving Johnny Quest, and um, you know, and so I watched Jenny Quest on Saturdays and I watched the show every day on TBS and it was, that was, that was my jam, you know, and that's kind of one of the things that just got me interested in design and animation, you know, was watching the stuff, which was just so different than watching the Flintstones or, you know, other sort of kid, kid based stuff. See, none, none of it clicked with me back then. I mean, I didn't, I looked at it just for the pure action of it. You know, it's not until I'm looking back, like maybe Transformers. Right. Okay. You know, but like I said, I, everything didn't click to me until probably college. I mean, sh I just kind of coast, I guess, until then, you know? <laughs> I, not, you know, it's weird. It's like the weirdest stuff that you sort of lock into, right? And I remember getting the VCU and telling other students about this Battle of Planets. Nobody knew what I was talking about. Yeah. And um, so I was like, oh, I, I need to show you this. So I had to find it. So I went to, like, the comic book store in Richmond. They didn't know what I was talking about because they probably didn't know it was Battle of Planets. They thought it was Gotchaman. And I remember calling around, calling to D.C., and I finally tracked a, a place down in D.C., calling long distance, spending money. And uh, they're like, oh, you're talking about gotcha, man. And, and, and so I talked to them and ended up over the phone with a credit card buying a VHS copy they sent to me. And then I brought it to, to class and showed it to my friends. And, you know, it's just such a different world. Like, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, somebody talked about something. Okay, cool, go on YouTube and you check it out and there's the clips and probably the whole, you know, whole episode and probably the whole series. But I think you had to work so hard, man. <laughs> it's like just to find this stupid tape, you know, yeah. it spent days, days and days and weeks for it to show up and and to share it with people. But um yeah, no, I just you know, 
I, I, I was very specific about the kind of cartoons I liked, the way they looked, mm-hmm. you know, how they, how they, you know, how they acted. Like, I mean, you know, I, I grew up a Star Wars kid, and, and, you know, like I was weird. Like, I didn't play with Star Wars the way other kids play with. They like scenes, they fight. You know, and I, I would like take all my, all my, my, my little figurines, and I would like, I'd organize them and set up scenarios, and then I would like leave it that way. Right. You know? And then I leave for a couple of days, and maybe like a week later, I come back and I'd recompose it. So it's like. Even at that time, like you know, I was like seeing things as like a director, like yeah. was, like you know, composing and finding things, and even dumb stuff like you should drive my mom crazy because I, I would rearrange my room like once every couple of months, you know, like basically doing interior design, you know, and and uh, and at the time not having any idea that's what I was doing, I just got bored and I wanted to rearrange mm-hmm. it and redecorate it a different way, and and now that's like kind of what I do for a living, you know, where you know I make I help make the sets and rearrange the sets and find the right clothes and find the right actors and you start doing all that. And it's just like, you know, I was doing that when I was like seven or eight years old. Were your parents into art? Not at all. Really? My, 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 my mom is, uh, you know, my mom sort of does a lot of different things. My dad's electrician by trade. My aunt, my mom's twin, uh, Jeanette, she was, uh, she's the one who got me into art. She was an yeah. artist. You know, she was, uh, my mom and my, my aunt are fraternal twins. Okay. So, you know, they look completely different. They have completely different personalities, but uh, yeah, my my aunt used to babysit me, and so she would keep me busy by like giving me a pad and pen, uh, pencil, and she could draw, and so I would emulate what she'd do, and I would do my own things, and yeah, she's the one who got me uh, got me into the art world, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, my parents were just like, you know, as long as I was quiet and staying out of the way, you know, they were fine with it. So, so I know my mom, she's the one, she's the artist. Okay, so I know she she got accepted into Pratt, but she couldn't afford it, so she mm-hmm. never went. But I remember, of course, my dad, he he didn't want me going to art either, yeah. you know. But uh, I remember coming out of school, being able to get that job in in New York and calling him and telling him how much I was getting paid. And he, he was happy, but he was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, after that, he never bothered me again about it. He goes, oh, okay, well, okay, cool. But that's... Yeah, I think, I think I, as a kid, I drove my dad crazy because I think my dad wanted me to... You know, we we raced soapbox derby cars. So we'd build those things, you know, and and uh, and I had fun doing that because that was like tangible. Like I yeah. could understand it, and I could design it, and I could make it. But like, you know, I think my dad wanted me to like work on the car with him. I had no interest, you know. He, you know, do other like when we go out chop wood. I was like, didn't want to do that. Like that was too much work. I'd rather be drawing. So I think I, I definitely drove, you know, my dad crazy. You know, I was like this like weird, you know, art nerd kid, you know, and and uh, you know that's that wasn't really you know, his world, you know, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, we sort of stay clear of each other too, cause I was, you know, doing my thing. So, but, uh, but now I think he's, you know, he's super happy about what I'm doing and, you know, proud of what I'm doing. And, um, you know, they, I'm more than thankful. I'm just in fact of like that they, they didn't, you know, try to force me to go a certain direction. Right. You know? like I have a lot of friends who grew up in households where it's like, you gotta be a doctor, you gotta be a lawyer and like these sort of obvious things to make money. But, you know, people are, you know, people, some people are passionate about it, some people aren't, you mm-hmm. know, and for me, like I had no interest in any of that kind of stuff, but, yeah. um, you know, I just kind of kept doing what I, what I, what I was doing and just sort of found a path, you know, in, in a weird way. So definitely thankful for that, you know, in terms yeah. of them not, not hindering that. That's the same. Cause I, I was one signature away from going into the Navy. So mm-hmm. I wanted to fly that a six intruder. I saw that movie and I was like, hell yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I remember I had the, like I said, Navy was out, sitting, came about four or five times. Everything was ready to go. And I didn't find out till later, but my mom was calling VCU like every day to see if I got accepted. Wow. Because she definitely didn't want me to go into the Navy. But uh, I remember yeah, coming back and uh, she made a big old sign on the door. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to VCU. Nice. Right. How stressful. You, had a good, you went through AFO, of course. Of course, yeah. Right, how stressful was that that year? Uh, it was stressful because... You know, like I worked, I worked, you know, and, you? and uh, yeah, definitely had a job. And, um, you know, I, I uh, it was a weird situation because in high school, I kind of gave up soccer. I got tired of it and I started playing tennis mm-hmm. and I started getting pretty good at it. And, um, you know, I had, a, had an, uh, an offer to go to Radford under like a little bit of a scholarship. And I was like, ah, I'm never going to be a professional tennis player. So that's not, you know, that school's you know not, not for me. And. So I went to Richmond and I met with the uh, the tennis coach and mm. um, he was like, hey, you know, like 
you know, I've heard about you. Like, you know, uh, we talked, we hit a little bit. He's like, you know, you should definitely be a walk on. You know, we don't really have any scholarships left, but you should definitely be a walk on. And I've only been playing for maybe about two and a half years. I mean, right. I advanced pretty quickly. And um, so uh, I was like, cool, sounds great. So uh, I, I leave, go back home, and go to school like two months later. And I get there and I go to meet with the guy, and he's not there. And, and I'm told that he's been fired. So they brought in a new coach. And um, this new coach came in, and the, the team had the VCU team, I think, had won like one match as a team in like three years. Right. So it was terrible. So I was like, this is great. I can play on this terrible tennis team and hopefully make it a little bit better, and I can go to art school. It's perfect. So the guy was like, yeah, you know, we're bringing in some people, but, you know, if you want to play against, you know, the people who were on last year's team. This is a VCU tennis team, right? VCU tennis team, yep. Okay. Was that so guy he, Boris on the team? He wasn't there yet. He came the, the following year. Oh, the following year. I can't so, hate. Yeah, I know. I know. It was good looking guy who's modeling in New York, you know, in a TLC video and, you know, great at tennis. Well, that's, they put that jukebox into Hibs, and he used to drive me nuts that the minute he would walk in, all you would, the girls would line up and just keep playing that freaking song uh, throughout the next, as whatever. long as he did. Oh, man, it's terrible. Terrible. So yeah, so like, so I end up like uh, playing in a stupid tournament, and then whoever won the tournament, I ended up losing to like the number one seed from last year. He played with the team, and they kept him till the spring, and then when they brought two new guys, and he had to beat one of those two guys, you know, to stay on the team, and he lost to both, and so the whole team was dismantled. So like a year later, they were like top twenty in the country. Really, Boris shows up, you know, and he's kind of playing and modeling up in, in New York, and uh, they got really good. So I used to play there with some buddies of mine, you know. Um, Surprised my wife hasn't run down. Are you talking about Boris? <laughs> He's a good looking man. I can't I can't lie, you know. But uh, you know, uh yeah, it was it was crazy, it was crazy times. But uh yeah, I, I you know uh, I love playing playing tennis and I wish I could have played on the team, but yeah, they were just they were amazing. They were like, yeah. they won the champ I think they won the NCAA tournament like a couple mm-hmm. years later. They were so good. Yeah. I wish the basketball team was good back then. I know. Do you remember do you remember Kendrick Warren or was that before your time? No, I don't he remember. Graduated the year I did. He was like he was like an all American high school guy, but um, didn't have a jump shot. He was six seven, so he was like that kind of weird in between size. So he couldn't really go pro because six seven in the NBA is sort of average, and you can have a jump shot. So he he didn't last long, but it was kind of like our claim to fame for a while that we had this guy that was pretty pretty awesome. I went to one game. I think it was against VUU, mm-hmm. and there was this gangster dude sitting right behind me, <laughs> and we would get up to cheer, and he'd tell us to sit down. And he, I was like, and I just got fed up, and I, I said something to him, and I thought the shit was about to go down. <laughs> I was like, oh man! But I remember that Rich, was rough, man, back in the day, dude. They, you know where the Richmond the raceway was, right? Yeah. So sure. One of our projects was going out there for photography. I had to shoot some, so I figured I'd go to the raceway. So no, none of us had cars. I had a, somebody finally dropped me off, and he said it was going to come back six hours later. I was done in like an hour and a half. Yeah. So I was like, you know what, fuck this. It can't be that far. And I decided to walk back. Okay. Right? So three hours later. Right through Jackson Ward? Yep. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I remember seeing the street corner. There was like 15 guys on it, and I had to walk through them. And I'm thinking, I was like, shit. So I had like a Nick shirt on. I threw my book bag, and I was like, you know, let me just act like I'm crazy. And I was like talking to myself out loud. <laughs> and I just kind of walked right through the crowd. And I remember I'm kind of clinching up my, my traps, just waiting to get hit in the back of the head. And, and I kind of walked through. And I remember walking up to like an elementary school and I'm not banging on the door. And this lady, she wouldn't even open up the door. And I was like, would you just call a cab for me? She says, don't I look lost? I was like, and she's like, <laughs> it, it took me like five minutes of trying to convince her. She's like, all right, hold on. And then eventually a cab came and we drove through the rest. And I'm just, I'm up against the window like this. I'm like, holy shit, thank God I got a cab, man. Yeah. I lived on uh, after I graduated. I, I found an apartment on uh, on Broad Street, like uh, right across from McDonald's, like a block down from McDonald's, right next to uh, what was that music music rental place? Um, but they some guy had bought the building and, and built out these great loft apartments. Like we had a probably about I don't know maybe like two thousand square foot apartment okay. and with a loft and thirty foot ceilings. It was amazing. It was amazing the place. And I remember uh, the rent was was six twenty five. And this is 96, 96. And, um, and people thought we were crazy paying, paying over $500 for rent. They're like, you can buy a house for $600. Like, this apartment's unbelievable. Now I'd, I'd give anything to be paying $625 uh, a month. 
uh, so we had the place and, uh, and you know, we park on broad street. And so I was in the apartment one night and we we're like watching and you know, we we're like, you know, not that close to the Richmond speedway, but you could hear it when the race was in town. You right. could, it was just so loud. So one night I'm like laying in bed and watching TV. And I also hear like pop, 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 pop. And I'm like, I like lay down in the bed flat. <laughs> it's like 20 straight bullets popping through the window. Cause you know, it, it's, it was Jackson Ward went down all the time, you know? And so many times I'd walk out of the building, you know, I'd come home from work, you know, I'd, I'd leave at like, you know, uh, 10, get home like 10 30 from, from channel six and dudes out in the corner and like looking at you and I, you know, had, Hell yeah. had a maxima, you know, I was like pimping my maxima ride and, and uh, guys are looking at me, you know, like, what are you doing down here? You know, but you literally go one block over and the world changed in a, in a, in a major way. So, I mean, I know when I was there, it was, uh, Richmond was like the number three murder per capita right. uh, in the nation. And, but uh, it's high up in the graphic design, though. High up in the graphic design. Yeah. So, best of both worlds. So. I had a gun pulled on me at that Burger King. Right no way. I, yeah. I was, because if you remember, there was a huge, you had the hospital there and there was this huge stone wall. Yeah, so yeah. I was, Sure. I would always go to 7-Eleven by the, what was it, the, what cafe, what was that place called? Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, on the uh, corner, So uh, on Gray Street. Right, right, something yeah, cafe, yeah. Or down, I don't know, I would always grab a hot dog. So one okay. time I was walking back, I saw my friends walking, I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump them. So I remember running around and I had to come up, and when I was running up the side of Burger King, some guy was coming out of that back entrance, and I just ran right after, past him, I, I startled him. And I got to the corner and I'm looking. He's like, dude, what the fuck's your problem, man? You almost got shot. I was like, I, I didn't turn around. He goes, dude, I almost shot you. And I kind of turn around and he's not pointing it at me, but yeah. he's, he's, you know, he's got his hand on it. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, you know what? Let me just ignore this dude. Like I'm thinking it's going to disappear or something. I was like, all right, man, we cool, cool. And he just walked off and I was like, what the f my second second semester freshman year, I needed, I needed money because I, you know, had no money and and uh, so I needed a job. So you know that Hardee's that was right, right across from Burger King. Right. So I started working at Hardee's. I'd work there two nights a week. And uh, one night I was working late, and I think they let me go like around like nine thirty. And I was usually working until like ten, ten thirty. So I'm leaving. And as I'm leaving, the manager is like stocking behind the counter, you know, facing away from the counter is like stocking milk, you know, in the in the the, the, the fridge there. So I was like, all right, you know, peace out, have a good night, and I'll leave. So I go back to work like two days later and they're like, man, you're not going to believe what happened, man. And I was like, what happened? They're like, dude, like when you left, like somebody walked in and I kind of remember somebody walking in through the door at the same right. time that, that I was leaving. They came in and pulled a gun on the manager. And so she's down there packing the you know, milk in and the guy's like, you know, give me all your money. Put your hands up. Give me all your money. And she thought it was me coming back being stupid. Oh shit! So she just doesn't. Fuck you, yeah, Michael. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And then so finally, the dude, give me all your money. She turns around and the dude's got a gun. He's just like, you know, so I had to give him, give him the register. But I literally just walked out like as this guy was walking in. It was, you know, downtown Richmond, man. It's no joke. Uh, that was some, some sketchy times back in the day. Because we we'd see the the renegades down at the Coliseum and walk mm -hmm. back, and it'd always be sketchy. Yeah, that little that 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 area between the Coliseum and and uh, I mean, between MCV and, and and VCU was was so gnarly. But now it's like VCU has gone all the way down there, so the whole area yeah. is just you know it's just college campus. Now. I kind of wish I knew like martial arts back then. It's probably better that I didn't. I would have thought I, I <laughs> taking could, out dudes. Oh, I, I thought you know my ego all inflated, thinking I could do so. I would have probably ended up dead like the first thirty <laughs> seconds. <laughs> That's insane. Taking people's butts in Monroe Park. Oh, man. I remember I, was, I proposed to my wife there. And I remember. Really? Right, yeah. In and then, Monroe Park. Yeah, because that's what we met in VCU. Nice. So I remember I, getting down there and I'm looking over left and right, kind of doing this real quick, you know, looking over left and right, you see, and just popping a question. And like, All right, let's go to Pecola's. Let's go. Uh, Pecola is the best cheesesteak oh, yeah. in the world. They bought the building right next to it. Next them. to it, yeah. They keep expand. They kept expanding, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever I go down there, I always had to pop into Pecola's and, and get me that. That was like my, you know, once a week I would treat myself. See, we yeah. would do it every Friday night because we did a, a radio show, Latinos in the House. Okay. It was like on the AM station. That's great. Yeah. Right after that, we would hop in there. Pecola's. And go oh, go so to Pecola's. Good. And that, that and Chanelos. That's how I started putting I ranch Chanelos. on my pizza. I don't know that one. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Interesting.
<laughs> oh my god, it takes me back. So, well, listen, man, I really appreciate. It. I know I don't want to keep you too long. Yeah, man. But do me a favor. Let me see. You always got the most amazing shoes. Oh, oh, uh, what, you right, got, let, what you wearing? Let me see. I got two pair. Hold on one sec. Sweet. I'll go with these. These are uh, Stan Smith. Let me see. Uh, Stan Smith, Pharrell, limited edition, pony hair with the Billionaire Boys Club print, pink soles. Well, Very cool. So I always got some sort of shenanigans going on with my, with yeah. my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Love well, sneakers, man. Cool. Well, cool, man. I mean, I think, shoot, I've known you for so long. I think it's kind of the first time we really got to sit down and talk. It's true, man. It's, it's like really always at cool. Pro Max or it's always somewhere where we're kind of in passing. But uh, yeah, mm. man. Yeah, we should definitely, uh, next time you're up, man, uh, hit me up and let's, uh, let's grab, a, grab a beer. Yeah, I mean, I'll be up soon. I mean, my, my grandmother, she's 85. She took a spill. Oof. So five broken ribs. So we're, oh, we're going man. back and forth. But she's okay. a fighter. So she's doing right. good. Good for her. Good. Yeah. But, uh, Sounds familiar. Yeah, I know you in BDA this year. I wasn't there this year, but uh, yeah, it was uh, um, yeah, the last two weeks uh, between Motion and then Pro Max was was a lot going on. So I'm kind of glad it's done. <laughs> Get back to work. Yeah, cool. But that, I'm not gonna miss LA. You know. Yeah, that's right. It's next year in LA for sure. I like it better in LA anyway because you you know it's a little easier with work because people aren't running running around back and forth. So very cool. So, yeah, you can focus. Sweet. Well, thank you, cool, man. man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, good talking to you. And, uh, yeah, well, I'll see you soon. Yeah, do this again, hopefully. Okay. Excellent. Later, man.